friends welcome to this session of think reviews audio podcasts where we share our thoughts on books we are reading exploring various adaptations set in the world of sherlock holmes by sir arthur conan doyle we came across the book series by author nancy springer who writes adventures featuring sherlock's much younger sister enola We have reviewed the first book in this series here on Think Reviews platform. You can listen to our audiobook review for The Case of the Missing Marquis on the platform of your choice. We have chosen to read all Enola Holmes adventures and in this session we would like to introduce you to the second book in the series, The Case of the Left-Handed Lady. It is a small paperback part of a series with matching cover pages done in dark backgrounds of black featuring a young thin girl attired in victorian clothes the cover page of the case of the left-handed lady shows her holding a lantern while featuring other elements of the story including a sketchbook a dagger a candle and a glove around her with its dark background This is not a standout cover page for a casual browser looking at a stack of books, but the fans of the series will admire the subtle hints about the story within. So let's look at the storyline. When we left Enola at the end of the first book, she had found herself a place to stay in London. In this book, she is in the same lodging place, staying as a much older person. Miss Mitchell. She also has set up her office under the name of Dr. Ragostein, a perditorian who can find lost people and things. She is still trying to communicate with her mother through the cryptic advertisements in newspapers using the language of flowers. Enola becomes interested in the disappearance of an aristocratic young lady called Lady Cecily. She visits the missing girl's house and discovers her secret drawings featuring the poor people of London. She also interviews her friend Alexander Finch and learns that both Alexander and Cecily were sympathetic to the cause of the proletariat workmen of this world. Slowly the threads of this mystery are unraveling around Enola, but this also means that she is getting dangerously close to a maniac. Meanwhile, Sherlock Holmes has deciphered Enola's messages in newspapers and is trying to find her through the medium of same advertisements that Enola uses. Enola's attempts to find Lady Cecily puts her life in danger repeatedly. Not only she escapes death narrowly a few times, She also keeps encountering her brother in most unexpected places. How far can she go alone trying to stop a criminal, find a kidnapped girl and staying out of reach of one of the great detectives of his time? You need to read the book to find answers to these questions. And now on to my thoughts about the book. One of the first interesting things about this book is its title. Now, most of us are naturally right-handed, but there are many people who are naturally left-handed. You may know someone who prefers using their left hand over their right hand. In fact, there are many celebrities who are left-handed, and it is quite an accepted phenomenon these days. But that was not so even a few decades ago. As right hand is considered the good hand, the hand preferred during religious ceremonies and so on, a lot of left-handed children also were punished and it was common practice to try and get them to change to be right-handed. This book highlights that this custom must have been common around the world. As the author shows us through Enola's thoughts, what a typical left-handed child would go through when growing up in England of late 19th century. I doubt I myself would have taken such a viewpoint, 
if it were not for the extraordinary freedom of my own upbringing. But having been raised by a mother who believed in letting growing things alone, I was imagining how it must have been for Lady Cecily. Her baby fingers had been smacked when she tried to use the wrong hand, toys taken away from her left hand and placed in her right, and all the scoldings. Her left hand might have been tied behind her when it was time for her to learn to print her letters. All through her schooling, her knuckles must have often been wrapped or her left palm might have been beaten with a strap. And then continuing to build the background of the London as it was in Enola's time, this time the author features the rising awareness amongst general public regarding the social and financial divides. Through the characters of Alexander and Cecily, we meet the young activists trying to emulate Karl Marx's Das Kapital and create a movement for recognition of workers' rights. Here are some of the historic comments that the author uses when recalling the workers' marches in London of those days, which will make you think about what the social life would have been like when it was not a common thing that everybody was to be treated as an individual with a respect but it was your class that decided how you would get on in this world. It is in bad taste for people to parade their insolent starvation in the face of the rich and trading portions of the town. They should have starved in their garrets. Or, had God decreed that three quarters of the populace shall live and labor in bond skewing, mind stunting poverty, while a favored few shall occupy their days by having their servants assist them in five changes of clothing? This country is mad for valuing people according to their titles. Why should an idle so called aristocrat be considered more of a gentleman? than any thrifty, sober, industrious member of the working class. And it is very easy to see how these thoughts would be common when a small percentage of the population wore ridiculously high maintenance clothing while a big percentage served them. For example, look at this observation from Enola. The hem of my long cloak and back of my even longer skirt dragged upon the city cobbles, indicating the social class of one who rode in carriages. A ragged little girl with a broom approached me. At my nod, the child hurried to sweep the crossing for me, banishing from my path the muck of soot, stone dust, mud and horse droppings that always coated the street. Such observations and sentiments also bring to mind the thoughts I had with the first book, that with hindsight we are able to see our past in a more comprehensive way. When Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was writing, he was writing about the world he inhibited and how he saw it. While the London of those stories was dark and gloomy, it didn't quite bring to mind the image that descriptions by Nancy Sprenger do. For example, The day was gloomy enough already, although the clocks had just struck one in the afternoon, a lamplighter climbed his ladder. For with the London sky thick with smoke, fog and soot, it might as well have been evening. All over the rooftops of the city, chimneys stood like dark candles spewing smut. Workmen and cleaning women walked past me, coughing. Someone would die of the caterer today. In this book, the author does tell us a little bit more about Lady Eudoria Holmes's character, with snippets here and there commenting on her love for freedom, and suffragette movements as well as women's rights. 
But at the time these ideas were still mostly ideas and reality was very different. We see how children in this world could work but had no real rights. I was a runaway upstart of 14. True, half the domestics and mill hands in London were my age or younger. And true, also, that any of us who committed a crime would be imprisoned, tried and hanged right along with Jack the Ripper, should the police ever find him. But we had no rights, none, not even a right to the money we earned until we turned 21. Legally, at age 14, I did not yet exist. In spite of the realistic view of the era as shared above, the author does not shirk away from featuring some ghastly and otherworldly stuff similar to the narratives of the Holmes adventures. For example, the references to mesmerism, which is kind of hypnotizing someone to get them to do your evil biddings, or the Dr. Jekyll versus Mr. Hyde personality transformation of the villain who turns into a monster with a wig. Nancy Springer also takes us on a tour of one of the very early versions of a department store. While Enola's experience until then is limited to small, individually fronted businesses, she is amazed by the sheer amount of goods and options presented by massive quantities of merchandise in just one place. But she also wonders at how it affects the people who work there. I wondered what constant exposure to this place might do to those who worked here. Hatters went mad and painters became poisoned. Laborers in cotton mills grew stunted if they did not sicken and die. This emporium also seemed somehow unhealthful to me. How might such a plant the Torah of pretty things affect, if not the body, then the mind? And how true it is, we often comment on the greed of the modern day world because we have unlimited choices. It is no wonder that this is one of the beginning of the huge commercially driven economy that feeds on just buying and buying and buying things that you may or may not need. In spite of all this, um, Enola's life is not a picnic by any means. She faces a lot of dangers on her own continuously. And it is difficult not to admire her courage or forgive her for an occasional lapse where she craves genuine friendship with someone. The most unusual and yet the most common thing that she yearns for still remains her independence though. The greatest harm I could possibly suffer would be to lose my liberty to be forced into a conventional life of domestic duties and matrimony. So as you can see, it is a very small book, but it has a lot of thought provoking features. And I enjoyed this little adventure. You will too if you are looking for a sparkling girl trying to find a life for herself while doing her best to help others in a world that is not quite ready to see her as an individual. We recommend you to find these books in a library near you or find them on your favorite book reader and give it a go. Do let us know how you like them. Please do let us know also if you would like us to talk about any other books that you have read and liked. You're welcome to subscribe to our channel so you get notifications when we publish a new podcast. Thank you for listening to this one and goodbye until the next one.